Hi everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Giovanni. And I'm gonna talk to you about femtosecond clearance spectroscopy of large porphyry nano rings today. So I'm gonna start from the basics. So I'm gonna start by describing how the simplest, let's say, time resolve experiment in the femtosecond, picosecond time domain, uh, time scale can be described. So in the, the simplest experiment that we can conceive is called, uh, let's say, indivisible ranges, transit absorption. So it's a two poles experiment. We have a first intense and short uh, femtosecond light poles, which induces a perturbation in the sample. And after some time, we look at this perturbation by a second, let's say, weaker pulse, which is usually Broadman, is typically white light in the modern days. And these second pulse we look at in the frequency domain on a detector. What we do here is to that the pump pulse is usually modulated at a frequency so that we can record sort of a um, sequential spectra in the, of the probe in which we have the sample which has been perturbed by the pump or not perturbed by the pump. And then we can perform a subtraction of the, let's say, pump pulse minus pump pulse spectra so that we record a, a differential spectra between the two different conditions. And if we do so for a series of time delays, different time delays between these two laser pulses, of course, we can recover dynamical evolution of the system in real time, even on really fast and short time scales. And on top of that, if the pump and probe actually as well, pulses are short enough in the time domain and broad enough in the spectral domain, on top of that, we can also access to coherent dynamics of our molecular system, or let's say solid state system, if we're interested in that's what we're interested in. So how do we, what we can learn from these differential spectra? So Basically, uh, uh, in a different spectrum, we can have either positive or negative signals. Uh, if we basically have like more light that reaches the detector when the sample has been perturbed by a pump, or if we have less light. So here in this figure, I'm showing spectra of a molecule at increasing time delay shown in different colors. And so we can see that we have positive and negative regions. So the uh, let's say the first negative region I want to look at is the one enclosed by a uh, orange square. And that's what we call ground state bleach. So it's a negative signal. And uh, it's caused by the fact that the pump excites the sample. So the probe sees a sample which is more transparent, let's say, than when it's not perturbed. And that's a negative signal, as we can see. And uh, of course, it usually matches in the spectral domain, the steady state absorption of our molecule. If we move to the red, so to the right side in the wavelength domain, we have another region where have, we usually have negative signals, which are called stimulated emission. So this is when the, basically the pump excites the sample, the probe sees an excited state, and it um, stimulates that excited state to decay back to the ground state, emitting an identical photon. So we have more light reaching the sample in this case. And so this is negative again. And if we move to the blue, instead in the green rectangular thing, we can see that we have some positive signals and this is called excited state absorption. This doesn't have a steady state correspondence and it's basically the excited state that is prepared by the pump, which has furtherly excited to, let's say, um, higher, energy excited states by the pro pulses. And of course, if the first uh, pulse generates a chemical reaction, triggers a chemical reaction, and we produce a photo product, that photo product is a new thing that's not there in the ground, in the unperturbed sample. So we'll, that will produce a, a positive signal as well. But we said that with pulses which are short enough on top of population dynamics, with this technique, we can look at coherent dynamics in the time domain indeed. So what happens is that when we have a short pump pulse, namely shorter than, for example, the vibrational period of a molecular vibration, we can impulsively excite this mode, creating a wave packet that can be either in the excited state, which is more intuitive, but also in the ground state. I'm talking about electronic states now. And that is due to a sort of Raman kind of like process. So those weight packets, of course, will evolve 
over time, they will move around in the ground or excited state electronic potential energy surface. And as a consequence of that, uh, they will modulate the energy gap between these two electronic states as a function of time. And that is seen in the spectra as a sort of oscillation in the time domain. These, in order to isolate these oscillatory behavior, which we, what we're interested in when we're doing femtosecond coherence spectroscopy is that we take the pump row, the transit absorption data set, and we get rid of the underlying slow population decay, which is shown here in the bottom as a sort of global fit, a solid line fit to the experimental data, which are in teal. And what we have left is basically those oscillation around like zero amplitudes, which are the, well, the features we're interested in. So we said that we have uh, both ground and excited state contributions. So the problem is now, how do we assign that? How do you like separate that be between ground and excited state? So the first thing one can do is think and say, okay, if I see a beating, an oscillation in the time domain on top of a ground state bleach signal, that's probably a ground state wave packet. So a vibrational coherence in the electronic ground state, if these beatings are seen on top of stimulated emission or excited state absorption, it has to be a vibronic coherence in the excited state, electronic excited state. On top of that, another thing that can facilitate the assignment is that those oscillations carry a phase, which is uh, depending on the probe wavelength, and they tend to have a sort of destructive interference for a frequency that matches the steady state absorption spectrum of this molecule for the ground state coherences, or the uh, or they either match this node, this amplitude node caused by destructive interference matches the maximum of the fluorescence emission for the excited state wave packets. And so this is seen, of course, in the amplitude, um, it's seen as a dip, and it's seen as a jump of the phase by pi in terms of like when we're looking at the phase of those oscillations. So, when we have these things, we can look at them in the frequency domain, also basically performing a Fourier transform over the pump probe delay time to yield a sort of frequent probe frequency resolved Raman spectrum. So a Raman spectrum for each of the wavelengths contained in the probe bandwidth. So this is the technique. What we use it for? We use it to look at those um, large zinc porphyrin nanorings. Um, we looked at those molecules because they're interesting because in a way they resemble some kind of pigment protein complexes that are found in uh, bacteria. Um, in bacteria, we normally have a number of chlorophylls which are sort of put on a ring shape. And here it's uh, porphyrin, so it's still tetrapyrroles. They're bound in a covalent fashion by those um, sort of diacetylene linkers. And what's interesting is that we observe, we you can tell from the steady state absorption spectrum and from also time result measurements that the exciton structure of this molecule is completely different. Namely, the um, 10 member nano rings are fully delocalized, the 20 are sort of transition regime and 30 and 40, despite the ring size increasing, the exciton does not span more than 20 chromophore units, as one could tell from the steady state absorption, which are the solid line in here, which are red shifting as a function of the ring size up to 20, and then the staying constant. And that's quite interesting because despite like looking molecules of the same family, actually the electronic excited states are quite different in character. And there's no indication also of vibronic coupling. So any vibration which is evident from this steady state absorption. And here as shaded blue and red areas, I've reported the um, pump uh, spectra that we used to study this morning. So we basically changed the wavelength of the pump to see if the dynamics were any different. And we found out that indeed they are. So these are the femtosecond coherence spectra here on the left. This is what we get when we excite with these blue poles. And this is what we get when we excite with these like red poles. So we can clearly see that in the time domain and also in the frequency domain, because basically these two graphs are the Fourier transform of these ones. So here we have the delay between pump and probe and here we have the wave number, which is the Fourier transform of these. The node of this oscillation moves 
And when we excite here on the blue side of the steady state absorption spectrum of the molecule, we get an node which is more or less here. And when we excite on the red side of the molecule, we get a node which matches really well the maximum of the fluorescence emission. So what we see that pump wavelength tuning allows us to observe better wave packets in the ground state, according to the theory I explained earlier on, or wave packets residing in the excited electronic state of this molecule. So a further confirmation of these is given if we take a slice of these sort of probe resolve Raman spectra at a frequency that we care about, which is this one quite intense 370 wave number mode. And we can clearly see that the amplitude has a dip, which is very close to the maximum of the absorption when we excite on this side. And the phase, which is in blue, jumps by pi and then jumps back. While when we excite, in resonance with the fluorescence, we get the node in the amplitude and sorry, the deep in the amplitude and the phase jump, which are matching quite closely the emission, the maximum of the emission of this molecule. So another interesting thing is that the phase is jumping really abruptly here, while here it has a sort of wavelength dependence. And these could tell something about the how an harmonic, uh, the excited state potential energy surface is compared to the ground state, for example. So what we've done here was basically here, what, what we learn is that exciting with different pump wavelengths, we can look at ground or excited state wave packets. So if we now integrate over all the frequencies in the probe, we get basically an impulsive Raman spectrum of the ground or, or the excited state of these molecules. So here we have this, the color code for 10, 20, 30, and 40 member ring and uh, the ground and excited state. Raman spectra. So we can see that in the ground state, what we have is this mode at 370 for the smallest ring, 375 for the smallest ring that shifts to the red as the ring grows and it also narrows down. That has to do with the strain which is induced by those ring structure, which is way more strong for smaller rings. And this mode is a stretching of the zinc um, nitrogen bond. So the, it's centered in the porphyrin core. While here we have this less intense mode, which is still a ground state mode, of course, when we look in here, which is a, a combination, not a combination band, but it's a complete motion that involves both methenic and pyrrolic carbocarbon bending and uh, uh, in-plane bending and stretching. On top of that, we also get strong solvent contribution. We are in toluene here because the ground state, of course, toluene is not resonant, so the signal should be weaker, but there's also a lot of it because it's the solvent, so we can still see all these contributions that are coming from solvents. If we move to the excited state, we can see a few interesting things. So we can see that the, for example, these zinc nitrogen, um, Raman mode is basically insensitive to the displacement of electron density from the ground to the excited state. And that's because it's a pi pi star transition, which is weakly affecting the molecular orbital involved in forming the zinc nitrogen bonds. Uh, on the other hand, these modes that come from methenic and pyrrolic shift to the red quite a lot. And it appears indeed as a shoulder here. Uh, so it's shifted by 26 wave numbers, more or less. It's 430 roughly here, and here it's like 405. And uh, this is due to the fact that, due to the symmetry of the molecule, that be, like the porphyrin monomer that belongs to DH2 point group, uh, basically the, the, those molecular orbitals are more antibonding in the excited state. So the um, frequency shifts to the red. And on top of that, we also have this signal, which is not there at all in the ground state, which is a mode that comes from a sort of distortion of the porphyrin ring as well, but it's uh, Raman cross-section gets enhanced in the excited state due to hyperconjugation with the arelic substituents on the porphyrin side. So the, the conclusions are that we were able in this way to observe vibrational coherences both in the ground and the excited state that were assigned looking at the frequency dependence of these nodes in the oscillations. And uh, by um, moving these information to the frequency domain, we were able to obtain uh, impulsive ra resonant Raman spectra of the ground or the excited state of this molecule 
And uh, surprising somehow, uh, conclusion is that here the vibration are quite insensitive to the degree of the exon delocalization because we had substantially identical spectra for molecules that display quite different excitonic behavior. So the main vibrational modes are indeed coming from the, um, let's say the monomeric units, which are constituting those large uh, porphyrin nano rings and as similar um, effects has been observed previously in pigment protein structures were still like all the beatings are given by internal modes of the chromophore rather than to the overall structure. So that's it. I want to thank my PI, Steve Mitch. I did my part of my PhD with him as well. And I was at Imperial for a while and I came back at UEA. These are the most iconic building at UEA in Norwich in the UK. Our, these are like student residents are called the Ziggurats. I want to thank Professor Harry Anderson and Michael the, who actually synthesized those nice molecules in Oxford. Ismail, that was my former PhD supervisor, which is now back in Brazil. My colleagues, Palace and Dale, we work on theory and simulation of ultrafast spectroscopy and EPSRC for funding our lab. So thank everyone for having listened to me. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. It was, it was an excellent talk. Thank you.